What I wanted to do today was look at a section of James that I've actually been studying for the past week or so. It has to do with this matter of of the Lord, the Lord's will. Quite often we approach it from the standpoint of desiring to know God's will so that we can do God's will. But there's another aspect to that, and it's when things happen differently from the way that we have planned. It becomes very easy to go through much of life uh, almost on uh, autopilot, where we're just doing things and moving forward and really not giving a lot of consideration to um, is this God's will or not, just presuming it is because it's the way we've always done things. Um, And then big challenges may come and we make big decisions or others make big decisions and things happen that we have not anticipated, that we maybe don't want to happen, and it just doesn't go the way that we have planned. Well, James chapter 4 discusses this a little bit. Um, He writes and he says, Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money, while you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. I don't know who this quote is from. Man proposes, God disposes. But in fact, um, it is exactly what happens. James says, now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we'll go to this city or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Well, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. Now, he's writing to first century Jews. They were merchants. Uh, They would, um, uh, for some, they would uh, pull together a caravan. They would plan to go to another city. Um, spend time there, carry on business, make money, uh, you know, and he says, well, maybe, maybe, but you really don't know. You can make the plan, but you really don't know. Um, There's more to it than that. You need to consider the fact that God may overrule or God may redirect Sometimes we're very surprised. There's an old legend, and this actually was shared by Peter Marshall originally. Uh, he was chaplain uh, for, the, um, for the Congress for many years, I think back in the 50s. An old legend tells of a merchant in Baghdad who one day sent his servant to the market. Before very long, the servant came back, white and trembling and in great agitation, and said to his master, Down in the marketplace, I was jostled by a woman in the crowd, and when I turned around, I saw it was death that jostled me. She looked at me and made a threatening gesture. Master, please lend me your fastest horse, for I must hasten away to avoid her. I will ride to Samara, and there I will hide, and death will not find me. Well, the merchant lent him his horse, and the servant galloped away in great haste. Later, the merchant went down to the marketplace and saw Death standing in the crowd. He went over to her and he asked, Why did you frighten my servant this morning? Why did you make a threatening gesture? That was not a threatening gesture, Death said. I was only startled and surprised. I was astonished to see him in Baghdad, since I have an appointment with him tonight in Samara. We can attempt to change everything on our own but our power is quite limited. Nonetheless, we need to do what we know know to do, and then the results ultimately are in God's hands because God alone knows our time. Psalm 139 and verse 16 says, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Well, we know our birth date. We don't know the death date. We don't know what day we're going to die. And, um, You know, in the background, you see a uh, fuel gauge. We don't know how much gas 
is in the tank. If our life is like that gas gauge, we don't have a clear indication. We can have a reasonably good sense. I mean, generally, um, we're told uh, that uh, man is given three score and 10, and if um, particularly strong, may live much later than that, much longer than that. For some of us, we're on um, reserve. Uh, We don't know. Uh, But there is a time, we're told, to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot. Nobody dies early, nobody dies late. Uh, Some people have the blessing or the curse, because it could be either, of knowing when they're going to die. Some people choose the timing of their death to some degree. They go into battle and they know that there's a very slim chance they're gonna make it through. But by and large, we don't know what another day will bring. We all have friends who in this past year um, went to glory. For some, it was a surprise. For others, it was after a long illness. For some, it was the byproduct of COVID. Um, But there are times, you know, we know they're in God's hands. Well, here we are at the beginning of a new year. And it is a good time to take stock. Uh, This could be a very good year for us, or it may not be. But it depends to a significant degree um, on our perspective. The... um, What James is talking about, he says, look, you have to see life as being brief. Now, uh, he says, what is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. And notice he says, if it's the Lord's will, we will live. Not just what we're going to do, but just the basic of um, being alive. And we see these other comparisons in the scripture too, with have to, which have to do with the brevity of our lives. Um, our life is like a shadow. In First Chronicles, it says, we are foreigners and strangers in your sight, as were all our ancestors. Our days on earth are like a shadow without hope. Now, in the context, um, you know, it's really... Uh, uh, almost a lament about our mortality. But the reality is that a shadow is there and then it's gone and it happens quickly. Um, Your life, we're told, is like a shepherd's tent removed. In those days, shepherds would uh, um, tend the sheep during the day they would move on to a new location and they'd set up tents so they would have a place to sleep at night. They might stay there for several more days and then they would strike the tents and the only thing that would be left after the tents were removed might be um, the ashes of a fire on the hillside. Um, Time goes by quickly and uh, we are... Uh, mortal creatures. Another comparison of our life given in Scripture is your life is a tale told. We've probably all sat around the campfire at one point or another, and you've heard tall tales. I remember as a Boy Scout uh, uh, hearing some. The modern equivalent is you turn on your TV and the television to some degree is like that campfire, and you see tall tales. Um, Some may be or supposed to be true and are not. Some might even be just turning on the news and they become tall tales. But the reality is um, we pretty quickly forget the tale that was told yesterday, the news from last week, and we move on. And a tale is good for a day. It goes stale pretty quickly. Now, if it's very dramatic, we remember things for a longer period of time. But if you watch a situation comedy, um, unless you see that one again, you will forget it in its entirety. You may, when you see it again, um, remember pieces of it as it unfolds. 
Um, the, uh, actually, it's one of the good things I've found about getting older. I can see reruns and think I'm seeing them for the first time. But our lives are like a tale that is told. They're ephemeral. Like a mist. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. I remember the first time that I drove down to Florida, my um, father-in-law and mother-in-law were living down here. They had moved down from New Jersey. And we drove, um, they were living in the Clearwater area. And when we drove back, we left at 4 4 a.m. because it was our plan to make it home in one day. And so uh, as the sun was coming up, we went past um, a swampy area and you could see the mist above the swamp. And it wasn't high, it was maybe four or five feet high, but it was a cloud above the swamp. And uh, the swamp went on for a distance and as the sun continued to rise, the swamp uh, mist just disappeared. It was gone. It was there. It was gone. Um, You know, the mist that comes when you speak in cold weather, you know, and it, that vapor, it's there and then it just vanishes. And so uh, God has scattered throughout the scriptures, this reminder that our life here is short. Now, Part of the reason he says this is so that we recognize that this is not our home. We are citizens of somewhere else. We are basically here on a journey, um, a pilgrimage. Joseph speaks to Pharaoh and he says this in Genesis 47, the years of my pilgrimage are 130. My years have been few and difficult and they do not equal the years of the pilgrimage of my father's. Now, he had 130 years. That seems like an awfully long time to us today. Nobody today lives to 130. Um, But consider the word that he uses, the pilgrimage, the idea that this is a life in which you are pursuing God, and this is a life that is in itself a journey, not a destination. So that... Um, You normally, if you're living in a temporary dwelling, you don't invest all of your effort in that dwelling. Uh, You see it very differently. If you're on a pilgrimage, you may set up camp somewhere and then move on. And it doesn't bother you as much if everything is not perfect because you know it's a pilgrimage. You know that if you're sleeping uh, in a um, in in a bedroll uh, and the ground is a little lumpy, that's just for today, or maybe a few days, and then you'll move on. And there is this sense in which life is like a pilgrimage or like a river; it continues to flow forward. And so we shouldn't get too locked in to one thing or another. Um, What James is continuing to emphasize, emphasize, and he's writing to Jews who are going through some pretty deep struggles this time. They have, um, for some, they'd trusted in Jesus 20 years earlier, uh, and um, they, they now had been paying the price for doing that for many years. Some had lost homes, some had lost families, um, some had lost jobs. Uh, no great persecution had begun yet beyond that, but they had lost things because they had followed Jesus. And there were difficulties that they had encountered because they had followed Jesus. And James just said, look, stick with it, persevere. Remember in the very beginning of James, he says, count it all joy when you face uh, various trials and temptations. For the testing of your faith works perseverance. Perseverance, those are words for pilgrimage. You know, you're walking, you're walking, you're walking, you're tired, and yet you have to walk some more. But there's a destination. And the destination of this pilgrimage is heaven. It's a glorious destination, and it's eternity. It's not a mist. It's not ephemeral. It's not temporary. 
Your life, we're told in Isaiah, is like a weaver's thread. Like a weaver, I've rolled up my life and he has cut me off from the loom. And just like a weaver's thread, we don't know when that thread will be snipped. Um, uh, There is a point at which the connection between our body and our spirit is severed. That's called the first death. The second death, and this is the death to be feared, is the separation of the spirit from God. Well, the first death, we don't know when that's going to happen. It could be today. It could be 10 years or 20 years or 30 years or longer from now. We don't know. But we need to live in such a way where we acknowledge that what we have is today. Today is the day of salvation, we're told, not tomorrow. Uh, Work today, for night is coming when no man can work. Today is the time to work. We need to view things based upon a daily agenda. Um, God um, has taught us, you know, as Jesus spoke and said, pray thusly or pray in this way. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. The idea that today is critical to be in the moment, um, to enjoy today. We're also told in 2 Samuel that life is like spilled water. You cannot go back and recover it, like water spilled on the ground, which cannot be recovered. Um, You can't get it back. What's spent is spent. Um, You know, the old saying is don't cry over spilled milk. You know, the scriptures talk about spilled water, but the concept is much the same. And what is, is, and you take it for that. And God is able to make a future when what is, is may not seem very good. Um, They, um, you know, I've met many people in my life, in my life, as undoubtedly you have as well, who have horrible circumstances. And yet in the midst of those horrible circumstances, they have incredible joy. I, I remember in my visits to Africa, meeting so many people who just made it through the day and yet they had the biggest smiles. These were Christians. They loved the Lord, and they were just happy that they had gotten food for the day and they were doing well for today. And then I I recall others um, who had also very difficult lifetime, life-dominating problems. You know, Johnny Erickson Tata, I remember when I met her, uh, she she is the uh, um, 17-year-old woman who, or at 17, uh, she was swimming on the Chesapeake, went out and was sunning on a raft and then dove in on the other side into three feet of water, broke her neck and became a quadriplegic. And that was about two weeks after she had prayed to receive Christ. And... Um, uh, she, when I met her, just had such joy. She was probably in her 40s at that point. And, um, uh, you know, now uh, is uh, significantly older, and yet that joy remains. How can somebody have that? Well, if you're agonizing through your past, it makes it very difficult. If you're agonizing through your circumstances, it makes it very difficult. Remember that circumstance is made up of two words in the Latin, circum and stance. Uh, circum, uh, the circle or the things around us, and stance, um, the things that stand. So what are the circumstances? They are the things that stand around us. They're not us. They're just the things around us. Letters used to be signed with, uh, at least in the Western world, and particularly in the English um, uh, Western world, with 
uh, the notation at the bottom, Deo Volente. Now, Deo Volente translates to Lord Willing. Um, so you would sign off and say, sincerely, Ron Perry, DV. And really meaning, everything I've written is Lord Willing. You can see the little boat in the background. Deo Volente, Lord Willing. Every time that boat goes out, Lord willing, they make a good catch. Every time that boat goes out, Lord willing, they get back safely to harbor. Every day the boat goes out, they come back, Lord willing, having caught enough fish so that they can make it through another day and continue uh, to expand. So Deo Valente, James says, instead you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. And so right now as a nation, we need to say, if it is the Lord's will, this will happen or that will happen. But nonetheless, we need to continue to move forward. God's will happens in God's timing. Now, there's an interesting historic situation that I thought uh, would be helpful this morning. Oliver Cromwell uh, was a Puritan. Now, you recall that there were Puritans and pilgrims, or Puritans and separatists. The pilgrims were separatists. And the pilgrims were so upset by the persecutions of Christians going on in England that uh, uh, they first went to Holland and then um, ultimately wound up coming here to America. And that happened uh, in the early 1600s. So I think it was 1620 that they arrived at uh, Plymouth Rock. Uh, And uh, the Christians that were there in England were divided into these two groups. The separatists, the pilgrims, if you will, um, basically said the Church of England is totally corrupt, totally debauched. The nation is horrendous. It's hard to bring our children up here. Uh, We don't like what they're learning in the streets. We don't like what they're learning anywhere. Um, It's hard to protect them. uh, And um, therefore we will separate ourselves from all of this. And they left. The Puritans were likewise Christians and the Puritans believed that they could purify the Church of England, and so they stayed. And then the opportunity came for them to gain great political power. It happened, I think, in 1649 or 1650. And uh, Oliver Cromwell was one of the leaders. He was a general, actually, in in, uh, the battles that took place. And ultimately, Uh, He was one of the primary individuals pushing for the execution of King Charles I. Now, he was a Puritan, uh, and he oversaw the execution of King Charles I. He was the third signature on the death warrant, and also he oversaw the end of the monarchy. He was the implementer of the Puritan-led republic. And in 1653, at 54 years of age, he became Lord Protector of England. And some say that he was a dictator. Now, he was very good in encouraging Protestant Christianity, but he persecuted the Catholics. Um, He sought to dictate Protestant righteousness by force. Uh, That may bring back in your mind um, thoughts uh, of uh, the uh, Roman Empire in 325, when likewise Christianity was mandated. And when Constantine did that, it was one of the worst things that could have happened to the church because you had Uh, You had um, pagans basically just rename some of their statues so that they could continue pagan worship um, under the label of being Christians and using Christian names. In 1658, 
at the age of 59, he died a natural death. And then in 1660, the royalists returned to power under King Charles II, and the monarchy is reestablished. Uh, in fact, uh, King Charles II digs up Cromwell's body, burns it, um, and hangs it. Uh, they, um, and England returns to its hedonism and formality. Righteousness could not be mandated. Righteousness could not be enforced by the government. Now, the scriptures tell us very clearly, where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no revelation, the people perish. And it is key that leadership be godly. Godly leadership leads to godly people. Um, however, you cannot enforce uh, that righteousness. You cannot enforce godliness. Now consider this. God's timing for bringing righteousness to England was not in the time of Oliver Cromwell. Rather, it's 1731. So, and also consider what happened after Cromwell. So after Cromwell, in the late 1600s, they passed a whiskey tax. Um, the whiskey tax was intended to drive additional um, revenues. And um, the average person could no longer afford whiskey. So people began building gin mills. They made their own gin. And uh, by the time you got to uh, the late 1720s, every fifth house in England was a gin mill. Public drunkenness was a massive problem. Babies were being born drunk. The, um, the challenges that Cromwell had encountered, the Puritans had encountered now had been multiplied many times over. Uh, the society was more debauched than ever. And into this maelstrom, a young man comes at the age of 18, George Whitfield. He accepts Christ and he goes to Oxford. He pays his way through uh, by working. He works his way through. Uh, and at 21 years old, with nobody really to support him, encourage him, um, assist him. He had no patrons. Um, he begins his ministry. He has no formal authority. He is licensed to preach, but they do not give him a church. So the Church of England should have typically at that point assigned him to a church, given him a church. They didn't do that. He didn't have the right background. He was an outsider in every possible way. And in 1735, he begins preaching. His first minister, his first message was at 1734 at the age of 21. 22, he really starts to preach a great deal. And uh, for the next three years, he preaches throughout England, bringing about a great awakening there. And then he comes here to America. For two years, he preaches in the American colonies, and he brings the great awakening here. Now consider this, he established no churches. He led no movement. There were no denominations that he started in his lifetime, but his messages changed England and America. One of his most famous quotes is this, a dead ministry will always make a dead people. Whereas if ministers are warmed with the love of God themselves, they cannot but be instruments of diffusing that love among others. Ben Franklin had a commentary on George Whitfield's impact, and uh, Franklin was intrigued by him. Franklin, uh, uh, his mind was boggled by the thought that Whitfield could preach to so many people in the open air, but he confirmed that Whitfield could preach to at least 30 or 40,000 people. His voice was that strong. But listen to this. This is Ben Franklin. In 1739, arrived among us from England, the Reverend Mr. Whitfield, who had made himself remarkable there as an itinerant preacher. He was at first permitted to preach in some of our churches, but the clergy, taking a dislike to him, soon refused him their pulpits, and he was obliged to preach in the fields. 
The multitudes of all sects and denominations that attended his sermons were enormous. And it was a matter of speculation to me who was one of the number to observe the extraordinary influence of his oratory on his hearers and how much they admired and respected him, notwithstanding his common abuse of them by assuring them they were naturally half beasts and half devils. And then Franklin says this, his commentary on what happened as a result of Whitfield going through, um, in this case, it was Philadelphia. It was wonderful to see the change soon made in the manners or behavior of our inhabitants. From being thoughtless or indifferent about religion, it seemed as if all the world were growing religious, so that one could not walk through the town in an evening without hearing psalms sung in different families of every street. Now, that's a commentary by a guy who was a skeptic, and that's what he saw. In God's timing, things happen. Now, there were people who lived under Cromwell who prayed that something like this would happen. It didn't, and they did not live to see it, but it happened. There were pilgrims who came here who thought that there was no way Uh, that the Church of England could ever be reformed, but it was. A young man that God called was used to transform England, the Church of England, and America, and the church here. God is able, in his timing, to do whatever he chooses to do. It is very much... If the Lord wills, life does not always go as planned, but it always goes the way that God plans.